Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. So yeah, hopefully this is the session you're looking for. If not, uh, I don't know where to send you, but uh, you can go out the door and figure it out, I suppose. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. So I've been in application security for, for 20 plus years. And so I really started in consulting and that's where I worked for probably about 15 years doing just a, a whole variety of application security consulting. So primarily, you know, application pen tests, but also design reviews and working with like SDLC and securing this SDLC before we had fancy terms for some of that stuff. Um, about five years ago, I moved into product security and, and really working with, you know, internal engineering teams and trying to do, you know, very much similar stuff, but, you know, being able to focus for a longer period of time as opposed to as a consultant kind of doing your thing and, and walking away. And so I'm based here in the DC area, so occasionally you'll see me at uh, the local OWASP events if you go to any of those. Um, and I've been at Datadog for almost two years. And so since it's Halloween, I figured we better have the, uh, the Halloween version of, uh, of our little icon here. So uh, yeah, it's Bits, our, uh, our uh, logo mascot, so to speak. So yeah, my, my team is called Security Design and Guidance. So what we do is, is basically are the furthest left in the kind of traditional SDLC shift left thing. So we try to work with teams when they are like writing design documents, writing RFCs, kind of specking out, you know, what it is they're trying to build, what problem they're trying to solve and get involved as early as possible in trying to build security in. And so um, in addition to, you know, a lot of other things, my team is responsible for what we call our security ambassador program. Unfortunately, the term security champions was already used at, uh, at the company for the sales engineers that specialize in selling our security products. So we had to call it something else, but uh, it's essentially the same thing as a security champions program. So that's what I'll refer it to um, as we're kind of talking through the presentation here. But if you hear me say ambassadors, that's what I mean. So I'm curious, uh, um, I'm sorry. So yeah, like I said, we wanted, we were gonna refresh the program and myself and um, you know my teammates had a lot of experience from other organizations where we'd kind of seen you know, problems with security champions programs and we wanted to try to avoid those uh, ahead of time. And, you know, we also learned some lessons as we went through this program and, and uh, you know, uh, implemented some of the things that we'll talk about in this presentation. But uh, in general, what we're trying to do is, is like, like the title says, level up the program as far as try to build something a little bit more mature than what we had seen in the past and try to avoid some of the common pitfalls. And so I'm, I'm curious to hear from you guys as far as, you know, what, what issues have you guys run into? Um, let's just see a show of hands as far as who, you know, manages a security champion program. So quite a few people, which would make sense as to why you're here. Um, what, what issues have you seen in your program, either in the current program you're in or in a previous one? Yes. Lack of leadership, mm -hmm. lack of leadership engagement. Yep. Lack of leadership engagement. Yep. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. The, the, the constant struggle sometimes between bottom up and top down approaches with these sorts of programs. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, we have roughly 60 uh, people from, uh, from different teams um, within the program. And it's the same five people talking at every meeting. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so that's, a, that's definitely a, an interesting problem. So we've, we talk about, I'll talk about a, that a little bit in the presentation as well, but uh, yeah, I've definitely seen that dynamic before. Yes, yeah, that's very true. Like, like many things, you know, it's, it's uh, easy to get started. Everyone's excited, it's something new and fun. And then, yeah, as time goes on, uh, you know, excitement wanes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, yeah. What kind of metrics should you track? How you can present those to leadership and that, uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Yes. Uh, provide adequate uh, education, learning, skills. Yes. Yes, yeah, I just educating them in the right things, getting them up, skilled up in uh, both, you know, security in general, but also in, you know, kind of your organization's uh, policies and tools that are available, things like that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, prioritization of, of security champion work. So that's definitely an, an issue I've seen as well. So one more? Yes. Yes, yeah, having a clear, you know, 
goal for the program as a whole, but also for the individuals as far as what we want them to be doing and uh, you know, how do we measure them against that? How do we ensure that it's moving forward? And I apologize, I have a little, okay, never mind. It's not showing up on your screen anyway, a little bouncy thing. Um, so yeah, so what I'm gonna do really is go through a lot of the problems that we've just talked about and uh, I, I, I title it solutions in the slides. What I don't mean to, that to come across as is like, well, I've got all the answers or you know, we've solved all these problems necessarily, but these are just you know, alternative solutions that you could you know, potentially apply to your program. You know, what worked for us in some cases or other things that we're still trying to implement. But uh, yeah, so that's really kind of how I wanted to structure this because it's not just about you know, what the problems are. I feel like you know, as security people, we're very good at finding problems and, and identif identifying those, describing them. Um, you know, solving them is sometimes more difficult. So that's what I wanted to kind of focus on in this pro, uh, presentation. So yeah, the, the first part is just kind of how do you get started? You know, how do you recruit people into the program? And so, you know, it can be difficult because what you need is you need people to have motivation, but they also need to kind of know about the program, be excited about it. Um, you need to have management and leadership support, really more at the lower levels of like their immediate manager needs to support this as something that's, you know, worth them doing. And they, they also need to kind of understand the process. Like, how do I join this program once I get in? What am I supposed to do? That sort of thing. And so, you know, you can see this, um, you know, when you first start a program or kind of relaunch one like we did, or, you know, even, you know, as you go on over time, that you're going to continually need to bring in more people because, you know, other people are going to leave. And sometimes you need to have representation in teams that aren't currently being represented. So having a, a good kind of funnel to, to recruit people is important. So how we address that is a, a couple things. One is that you know, we made the program very easy to join. So it was really just a matter of you join the Slack channel and then now you're part of the program. You know, so the kind of behind the scenes training gets assigned to them in our LMS system and you know, we start tracking them in our, pro, uh, our database as uh, you know, what level they're at and all that other sort that we'll talk about later. Um, so that was part of it. And then the other part is, you know, as we're doing outreach, as we're maybe speaking at like, you know, we did a, a presentation at our engineering all hands, you know, we wanted to give some motivation, you know, of, you know, we wanted to say like, hey, this is why you would want to join this. You know, not only are you going to get some, you know, security knowledge and authority that we'll, we'll also talk about in a little bit more later. Um, but also, you know, we've got leadership buy-in that this is something that's going to look good on your performance review. So we've actually seen quite a number of our ambassadors that have come through the promotion process and we see that they, you know, one of the th items listed in their kind of promotion announcement is that this person was part of the ambassador program. They, you know, supported the launch of it and also that they completed the training and have done, you know, additional work on that program. So it's something definitely good to see that their manager, their immediate manager is recognizing, um, recognizing that. And, you know, swag is always good. Um, there's a lot of logistics with that that we've uh, still been honestly trying to sort out um, with a distributed company. You know, we've, we've got, uh, you know, several major offices, but we also have a lot of remote employees. And so how do you get that distributed out to the right people in, in, a, in a timely manner? And, uh, you know, we're working, uh, working through some of those issues still. Um, and then really just spreading the word, you know. So, you know, you can, uh, like I said, present at, like, engineering. Try to go where the engineers are as far as engineering meetings. Um, Slack channels, but also, you know, being, um, using your ambassadors as, or your security champions, I should say, as ambassadors, you know, of, they should be spreading the word about like, hey, this is something that's, that's worthwhile, especially if they're, you know, getting promoted and that's being seen by other people as like, hey, this is something good that we want to be involved in. <clears throat> so another problem that you'll run into as, as kind of uh, related to that is once you start advertising a uh, champion program, sorry, <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> You'll find that a lot of people are, uh, are interested in it because they just want to learn about security. So, you know, the security champion program is generally tar targeting your, like, software engineers, your, <coughs> your developers, and, but you're going to get people from sales or IT or interns or just other random people that are like, hey, I want to learn about security. Can I be part of your program? And so it may, may not be you know, feasible to just kind of turn them away and say no. But what you can do is you can basically try to you know, redirect that effort in such a way that it's not going to kind of cause issues in the program as a whole. So even though these people are not the, the target audience, we don't want to just you know, kind of give them a bad taste. So what we did is we, we actually just 
define a number of different roles in our program, and I'll talk about those as we kind of go through these slides. But in particular, the kind of people that are not the targets of this uh, typical program are going to be in this what we call an observer role. So they will still get assigned the training, um, but we don't track whether they complete it or not. They're still invited to the meetings, but you know they don't have to show up. Not that anyone has to show up. Um, so really, they've got kind of the ability to learn more about security and participate in like our Slack channel and that without having the same like expectations and responsibilities and, and privileges that you would have as a typical security champion. So, and it also just gives us a nice way to track that um, when we're tracking our participants. So we have, you know, by defining people as this is an observer, we know that this is someone that, you know, we don't need to worry about whether they completed the training or not. We're not expecting them to take on um, security reviews that we're maybe getting our security champions to support us on, that sort of thing. So we found this to be very helpful because, like I said, you, you are going to get a lot of people that want to learn about security, and we want to encourage that. And uh, so this is a good way, I think, to make it happen. And then this is uh, one of the things that uh, you know we run. I've run into definitely in other organizations. I think was mentioned uh, earlier is, you know, security champions are not always in a position of authority, and they typically aren't because the security champions are going to be technical people. So they're going to be generally you know typical individual contributors, software engineers that basically want to, you know, they want to help secure the thing that they're building, but they don't necessarily have the authority to, to drive kind of priorities. So, um, you know, they, they can't necessarily, they, they might have some flexibility in their own schedule as far as like, you know, especially if their manager supports it, that they can spend, you know, 10, 20% of their time doing some security champion kind of stuff. But they have little influence over kind of the larger team that they're part of, unfortunately. And then on the other side, you get kind of the top-down push that, you know, once you've got this champion program established, then it's a, an avenue that, other teams in security might look at is like, hey, we need to get a bunch of vulnerabilities fixed. You know, let's use our security champions and kind of try to hold them accountable for getting these vulnerabilities fixed. And it, you know, it kind of makes sense because it's like you've got these distributed people, and by making it more, uh, you know, specific as like, you know, this person needs to address these issues as opposed to just like, you know, a million on a, you know, a typical dashboard, million vulnerabilities. But the problem is, like I said, you're just putting the champions in a bad spot because they don't have the ability to really control you know, when those things get fixed. So how we uh, solve this issue is we define a separate role for what we call a security proponent. And so this is separate from your typical champion um, in that this is generally a manager, uh, like a first or second level manager maybe, um, or perhaps a product owner or product manager. They're basically someone who's in involved in setting priorities for the team as far as you know when they're going to address uh, certain issues when they're going to implement certain features not not just on the security side but just on the entirely um, the, the entirety of the kind of features that the product is, is building and things like that so because they're involved in that overall they're then able to advocate for security fixes and security tasks so you know, they basically have that responsibility of like, okay, so you're, the proponents are the ones that we should be going to when we've got security issues that need to be addressed, or even like, okay, a security test needs to be done, we need someone to help facilitate that, they can help allocate time in the sprint schedule or the release schedule in order to make those things happen. So, and because these people are managers or, or on the product side, they're generally you know, very busy. Um, so we don't have you know, very stringent requirements for them as far as training or anything. It's really more of a responsibility than it is a, a training issue. And the, the, the kind of approach that we went with was that our security champions, you know, as much as possible, we want people to be volunteers because they're going to be kind of getting into the technical details and you know, really want to have them be motivated to learn about security. The security proponents might be more voluntold because you really want to have those people across the organization that can be responsible for addressing security issues that are present in you know, the different products and applications and things like that. So, um, so because it, they might be kind of voluntold, you want to make it as easy as possible for them, at least as far as the logistics. But there is the reality of you know some somebody's going to have to do work. Generally, they're not the one doing the work, but they're going to have to allocate the time and perhaps delay other features or other things in order to make time to uh, al uh, to do some security tasks. So an another issue that we've ran into is that you know not all security champions are are equal. You know um, when you 
start a, a program or relaunch a program or even just generally new people come in, most people you know, are going to not have a lot of experience with security. And so you kind of want to start your training from square one. You don't want to assume any prior knowledge. Um, you don't want to have like prerequisite requirements because that's just going to make it even more difficult to recruit um, champions. But you are going to have some that either have significant experience in the past or they're just motivated to learn more. They're people that you know, will read security blogs and you know, perhaps be more vocal in your security champions, you know, Slack channels and things like that. And so what you want to do is you know, make sure that those people that are super motivated or experienced don't get bored. But then you also want to make sure that the new people are not overwhelmed, just you know, kind of having high expectations or a high level of training that you're kind of asking them to go through initially. So how we uh, handled this issue is that we basically said, we're going to define different levels of champions. So how we defined it is uh, three levels, you, or four, well, three levels beyond trainee. So you start out as a trainee that we'll talk about in a little bit. And then the, uh, once you've kind of completed your initial training, you become proficient. And uh, then from there, you can then move up to advanced or expert if you, you know, so choose. But, you know, so there is a process to move up, but there's not an expectation that you have to move up. So it's perfectly fine for someone to make it to the proficient level and just decide to stay there. And, you know, they don't need to become, you know, the uh, security expert. And the idea also is that eventually, like beyond that, you could potentially look at, hey, if, if you're an expert security champion, then it might be something that you could look at, you know, transitioning into security full time. So those are people that you can maybe use for internal recruiting as well. So some organizations use, you know, a lot of them use belt colors, like, you know, you have yellow belts and green belts and whatever. Um, so we, we just decided to go with this nomenclature because we felt it was, uh, you know, easy to understand for, for people. Um, and especially, we've really focused on the trainee and the proficient level initially. And you can always define the advanced and experts levels a little bit later. And so what you get with those roles is you really get an escalating responsibility, but also privileges. So they may have some additional training that they need to complete. They may need to you know, handle security questions from their team. Maybe <clears throat> at the initial level, uh, as a trainee or proficient, they would handle from their immediate team. And then as they move up, they might handle from larger organization that they're part of. Um, they can provide input into new security programs. They're definitely a good you know, per resource that you can use to get feedback on, hey, is engineering going to like this? Is this something that's going to work out? Um, <clears throat> you can also give them increased freedom to you know, deal with tool reported issues because you know, a lot of people you know, that run tools are going to know that you know, you're going to run into a lot of false positives. And so your trainee, you know, brand new security champions, you may not trust them to know what's a false positive or not. It's very tempting for them to just click false positive on everything and be done with it. But as people move up the program, you can have you know, more um, reasonable expectations that they're going to understand what might be a false positive, what might, what might not be. We've had some experience with looking at some things that they've marked, and you know, we feel like they have that um, are ready for that responsibility. So <clears throat> that's, a, that's a very... Um, I think useful one because it helps us uh, as far as dealing with false positives, but it also helps the champion and their team as far as not having to deal with those uh, issues either. And the, the last thing they might do is just support other champions. And so we can talk about that in a little bit as well. But the uh, basic idea is that you know, once you've got that critical mask of champions, especially at the higher levels, then they can start you know, educating the people at the lower levels that they're coming into the, the program. <clears throat> okay, so here's another one that I know was mentioned earlier is how do you keep people engaged? You know, everyone's going to be motivated when they join. If you launch or relaunch a program, everyone's going to be excited about it. But people are human, so the energy is going to diminish and, and, you know, other priorities are going to slip in. So how, how you keep people motivated so that you can, you know, keep the program going with also reasonable expectations that, you know, this is not their full-time job. You know, so this is something that, uh, you know, we want them engaged in, but not, uh, you know, um, have, make sure that we don't have overly high expectations for them, I suppose. So the, the beginning of that is, is really just with that trainee role. So the idea is that um, when you define the trainee, the expectation, now we haven't, you know, really enforced this, but the expectation anyway is that 
you know, you're going to have, you know, six months or maybe even three months to complete, you know, your initial training. So the idea is you want them to, you know, when they've kind of joined the program and they have that excitement, let's get them through the initial training in order to see basically, you know, can they complete that? And then also can they, you know, complete an exercise, if, uh, which is what we chose to do at the end of the training process so that people can uh, show basically that they know how to create a threat model and can, you know, basically do some of the things that we were going to expect them to do once they make it to the proficient level. So the, the approach we chose was to have the training be entirely company specific. So we, um, we do have general security training that like all of our engineers have to go through for you know, compliance and, and various other reasons um, on, you know, secure coding training. And so we felt that was kind of sufficient to cover the general. And at least for the proficient level, we wanted to focus on really kind of how our company does things, you know, what frameworks are available to help you in securing various things, what tools you should be aware of, what teams you can bring in for various things. Um, one of the things we thought was, was really helpful was just basically having a presentation on, you know, who are all the different teams in our security organization? Because, you know, for people outside of that organization, a lot of times they don't understand kind of you know, who's who and what's what, and you don't expect them necessarily to remember all that if you've got a large organization like we do. Um, as far as I think we have, what, 12 or so different teams, I would think, within security, probably more than that. But what you want them to know is at least that these teams exist so that they can remember, like, hey, if I come across a cryptographic issue, oh, there's a team that, you know, can help me with that. And they may just have to go to the general, you know, hash security or just the security ambassador or security champion channel on Slack in order to figure out what team that they you know, actually want to connect with, but at least they know that that team exists and that there's someone that can help them in that area. So we found that to be very useful. And so when we relaunched the program, we really you know, focused on doing live training. Um, that helped, I think, just again, keep motivation of people to get through it. You know, if you, you tell people they can do something anytime, then they're just going to keep pushing it off. But if it's like, hey, you know, we've got this on the calendar for, you know, this month we're doing it on, on these two days, and we just did two hours one day, two hours the next day. And, you know, you do that a few times, and that helps really kind of jumpstart things. And it also helped us refine our training so that basically the last time we did that, we had, you know, a pretty solid uh, set of recordings, and we can basically just turn that into our on-demand training. So now, you know, we kind of have more of a rolling process where people can join any time and they get assigned into these uh, trainings in our learning management system. And once they've completed them, then we can kind of pull them through the exercise. And uh, it's really, I think, worked out pretty well for us. So another thing we did when we kind of started the program, we really pushed this, was uh, have a, a mentor, you know, that's assigned to the security champions. Oops. Yep. So this was initially we, we actually, you know, because we had quite a number of new champions coming into the program, we recruited across the, the global security organization and said, hey, can we get some people that can help us be mentors for these new champions? And so um, that worked out really well as far as having that initial push. I think we had, you know, 30 or so different mentors from different parts of security. And I think that was really helpful. Um, now that we've moved to more of that kind of rolling process where we're kind of getting a few ambassadors every month maybe, um, we generally just kind of mentor them within our team and, uh, you know, not, you know, sometimes through dedicated mentorship efforts and then also through office hours that we have that are, you know, basically every week we have one hour set up on the calendar that, you know, anybody as a security champion can come in and ask us about, you know, how to get through the process, any questions they have. But also we just talk about general security you know, topics if appropriate. And we also use it as office hours for my team in general as far as people that have design or architecture security questions. Um, and then in the future, as we kind of define those later levels, I think that's part of you know, what those uh, you know, maybe more advanced or expert security champions would be able to do is you know, mentor the, the lower level people and bring them through the program. So, I think that's a, a good approach that we're hoping to get to um, next year. And then the other thing that uh, you know, um, our team has been doing is, is really just kind of recognizing what's going on um, in the program. So when someone graduates from a trainee to uh, a proficient level, you know, we announce that in our Slack channel for the ambassadors, and so people see that. And then also we um, will try to indicate that in um, an email to the manager, so that way the manager sees that, hey, you know, this is something that happened and this is something good they did. 
you know, um, we also try to keep an eye on promotions. And so if one of our ambassadors gets promoted, we, you know, congratulate them on our Slack channel for the ambassadors as well. That way we can just really, you know, try to just provide that kind of positive vibe of, you know, good things are happening and people want to be part of it. And, you know, also if we um, run into um, situations where there's, you know, a significant issue that a, an ambassador um, has identified or remediated, then, you know, we will try to call that out as well, both, you know, through our Slack channel and potentially through their leadership. Um, and then the last thing that we've been doing um, in this slide anyway is just, you know, some short feedback surveys. Um, it's tough to get feedback sometimes, so we try not to make it like too long um, as far as, you know, it's going to be intimidating, but we, we want to try to just get some actionable items of what's going well, what can we do better. And I think, you know, doing that on a regular basis really helps in, you know, getting more um, just fresh ideas into the program, you know, from, from the people that are part of it. And then um, I think this is the last slide on this one. So this uh, credit to uh, Dustin Lear, who um, has done some talks at other OWASP events. He's not here uh, for this event, unfortunately, on Security Champions. And he made this graphic um, that really talks about, you know, the kind of rewards that you can provide. And so, you know, we mentioned swag earlier. That's certainly something that kind of falls under the stuff, you know, on the right. But there's other things, you know, some of which we've talked about a, a, as well, as far as, you know, having these labels, public recognition, but you can have you know, lots of other things as well. So I think this is a great graphic to kind of think about you know, what are the things that you can use as to, to reward uh, people as they join the program or move up in the program. And it really, um, you know, it, it helps to kind of have a little bit in all those different areas as opposed to focusing in one. Yeah, and so I think this is a, the last problem that we're gonna go through. And the idea here is, you know, engineering leadership, but also security leadership, your own leadership are going to want to know, is this a worthwhile program or not? You know, should we be doing this? How do we know it's being successful? And, and how do we uh, kind of approach that part of the, uh, the situation? So, um, so one, one thing to start off is just having, you know, a clear mission and, and purpose for the program. So sometimes, you know, leaders always like to have mission statements. Uh, my background is, is more in the government and military, so I, I always like those things as well. You know, just understanding, you know, what is this program intended to do? And, you know, also, you know, maybe not directly, but indirectly, you know, what is it not supposed to do? So, you know, what we can do is say, you know, hey, our goal with this program is that we want to, you know, either increase, you know, you want to, you know, ultimately you want to, you know, decrease the vulnerabilities or, you know, improve the security of the things that are being built, um, but also, you know, it can also support, you know, various, you know, compliance standards that sometimes have more like secure development, you know, requirements that you might need to meet. There's also, you know, different roles in the program that, like we mentioned earlier, you know, we want to make sure are being used appropriately. So, you know, um, if we've got security kind of mandates or things to be pushed down to the engineering organizations, that should be going through our proponents as opposed to the uh, ambassadors or champions, I should say, that are, you know, the more technical people that can handle dealing with, um, you know, uh, looking at new security tools, trying to help evaluate them, providing in input on various processes, things like that. So, um, you know, that, that's a good starting point as far as getting management support. And then um, another thing that's useful is, you know, just showing impact. So, you know, they want to see ultimately, like, what are we getting out of this? And so, you know, um, it was mentioned earlier that just, you know, counting the number of, you know, champions in the program is not necessarily useful, especially if you're not tracking, you know, are they actually participating or not, or are they just, you know, names on a spreadsheet. Um, so what we do is, you know, we try to track not just the, uh, you know, the, the people that are in the program, but also the work that they've done. So for all of our security reviews, you know, some of those are performed by our champions, and so those get indicated in, in the kind of tracking system. We use JIRA for tracking our security reviews, so those will get indicated. Um, and then also, you know, vulnerabilities that are identified by those security reviews also get um, uh, tagged in such a way that we can identify, like, hey, this is how many vulnerabilities have been found, and by the way, these, this many have been remediated. You know, so this is a great way to really show clear risk reduction. And so, you know, how we do that is uh, I've got a couple, you know, graphs here that, uh, you know, I had to obscure a lot of the names and numbers and all that. But the basic idea here is the, the one on the right 
uh, or the one that's shown now anyway, uh, what it's showing is basically the number of ambassadors that you have in each of the uh, organizations, number of champions, I guess I should say. Um, and uh, so that you can kind of allow that to see, you know, okay, this is, you know, which organizations are maybe uh, doing better at adopting the program versus others. Um, along with, you know, we're breaking down the colors that are showing which ones are, have completed the training and which ones are still kind of going through it. So this one in particular is just showing the champions. It's not showing proponents or observers. That's another benefit of, you know, having those different roles well-defined is that you can have people basically, you know, to have these kind of charts without kind of muddying the water with some of that other information. And then the other issue here, uh, or the other chart here, is we're showing the number of vulnerabilities that have been, you know, discovered by the champion. So, um, you know, the organizations are in the same uh, order, basically. So, you know, you can see that the one with more um, uh, people is going to find more issues. So that's, you know, logical. And what we also break this down to is, uh, you know, there's limitations in, you know, how much you want to break it down, how many different metrics you want to show to leadership. So what we chose for in this one is that we're just showing, highlighting, you know, the ones in red are overdue issues, basically, that are beyond the SLA. The ones that are in yellow are within SLA. We also have a couple other categories of things, you know, green is fixed, but, you know, we, if they're risk accepted or um, we also track, you know, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, our team is really trying to get involved at the design and architecture stage. So if we're finding even a critical vulnerability in like something that's written up as an RFC and there's like no code written yet, there's not an SLA associated with that. So if it's what we call pre-implementation, that basically means that it's, you know, ha that hasn't actually been written, it's not deployed anywhere, there's no real issue, and those are basically exempt from our typical SLAs that we have for um, vulnerability remediation. The only requirement being is that they, you know, expected to fix those before the, the system does actually launch. So yeah, a couple, couple slides here just to give you guys some more information and then happy to take, take questions after. Um, so first is that, uh, you know, we're at an OWASP conference, so OWASP has a security champions guide and there's a project around it. They actually have this really great uh, graphic here around, you know, kind of what their kind of expectations of, of a security champion program. That can be very useful in, you know, if you're trying to launch a program or trying to, you know, relaunch or reinvest in a program within your organization. I think it helps. And it also has some good, you know, uh, I think kind of rules of thumb there around, you know, anticipating personnel changes, making sure that, you know, this isn't a one person show as far as managing the program. You've got a good kind of approach to knowledge sharing and creating the community in order to, you know, kind of pull things forward. And then the other one, as I mentioned earlier, Dustin, you know, had some great things. So his, uh, where I pulled that graphic earlier from is, is this very long URL, security champions. Six, or security champion success guide, only one S, I guess, in there, .org. Um, there's, you know, one of his presentations there, but he has a bunch of other things on YouTube. He's done a variety of different presentations around, you know, his experience and, uh, and that. So I think it's, uh, you know, definitely something good to look into and, and see, you know, some other perspectives. And yeah, so that's it for me. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. You Yeah, so our training is all in-house. So like I said, it's about four hours of training, actually probably a little bit less. So we break it down into, I think, six or so, like 30-minute modules. So one of them that I mentioned before is, uh, you know, the different teams within security. We also talk about, you know, just the program as a whole and kind of, you know, a familiarity with it. Um, and then we also get into kind of the tools that are available within our organization. So, you know, where they should be looking for source code vulnerabilities and where, you know, um, cloud security posture vulnerabilities will show up, you know, that kind of thing as well that we, we educate them in. So, yeah, um, we, we chose to basically make all of our training kind of specific to our organization in order to make it really relevant. Um, and we do provide kind of resources more generally to people like, hey, if you want to learn more about security, here's some, you know, useful sites and, what, and you know, videos, those sorts of things. One question. Sure.
motivates people to take on more work mm -hmm. without doing the saps. So mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, I think that that graphic really kind of covers the gamut there, because uh, like I said, some people do focus more on like the stuff, or they may more focus on you know kind of the responsibilities. So I think there's you know a variety of ways that you can motivate people, but ultimately, yeah, I mean people are human, and so especially if they're particularly um, busy, you know, unless they've just got an interest in security and maybe an interest in maybe moving eventually into a security um, career then, yeah, I think you need to, to give them some motivation there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Great presentation. I really enjoyed. Um, mm -hmm. We are supporting one large financial institution on an AppSec uh, program, including AppSec. They call them as, uh, AppSec advisors rather than <laughs> champions. Um, it all depends on how you structure, um, you know, the... AppSec champions are actually in that organization in the development team, and the AppSec mm -hmm. advisors are in the security team who actually train the champions, um, and so that they can inculcate you know security within their development activities. Right? Mm -hmm. um, where do you see um, the line drawn between an AppSec architect who pretty much like plays some of those roles that AppSec, uh, I mean the security pro proponents do? Right. Yeah, I mean, so the security proponents are more, you know, in um, the development of a given application or product or service or whatever. So they're kind of responsible for, you know, their piece of the pie. Um, you know, for example, my team that does, you know, kind of design and architecture security, you know, what we're looking at is basically, you know, across the board, how can we try to build like the paved roads kind of things in order to make things more secure as a whole. Um, and then some, some of that involves, you know, kind of assigning things out, but it generally tends to be like more across the board of like, hey, all of the proponents, if you're not doing X, then you should start doing X, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure. Hey, Chuck. Uh, so firstly, uh, great presentation. Thanks for putting it together. Thank you. Uh, I had two unrelated questions. So I'll, sure. I'll shoot the first one. Uh, and it is around the success of the program, mm -hmm. right? So you showed two metrics. Mm -hmm. First one is training completion, and uh, and the second one was uh, bugs reported by security champions. Right. right. Uh, so if I had if I have a team with a security champion, dedicated security champion, and another team without a security champion, uh, like if they file equal number of bugs, in that scenario, how can I like say that this is a successful program? Basically, I'm looking for more metrics to prove to my leadership that this is worthwhile investing more into. Uh, are there like any <coughs> suggestions you have on that? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, uh, I mean, within security, um, there was a talk yesterday about, you know, metrics and that. I mean, I think the reality of it is with the technology that we have today, we've got a variety of different metrics you can pull. I mean, ultimately, you can't measure what you really want to measure, which is, you know, are we more secure? Because there's no, like, way to measure how secure you are, really. So you have to use what I would call proxy measures. It's like, okay, we, we have reason to believe that if these metrics get better, then the overall security should be getting better. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of, you know, you can't look at just one thing is what it comes down to. Because I, I know that sometimes uh, I've had talks with some of our leaders where they look at, like, oh, you know, how many vulnerabilities are you finding? And it's like, well... That's part of it, but you know you also have to look at the severity of those issues. Are they getting fixed? You know, and you're you're certainly going to be uncovering issues where you're looking. So if you're comparing teams, saying, "Oh, this team has more vulnerabilities," well, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're worse. It could mean that they're just looking harder, or they're actually being more honest in you know how they're reporting things. So I don't have a direct answer for that because it's a it's a really tough problem. But I do think it's it's something to be aware of, and that. You know, you can't just pick one number and say this is going to be basically how we prove our worth. It, it needs to be kind of a combination of different ones and trying to also try to choose them to be kind of orthogonal where it's not, you know, there's a little as little correlation as possible between the different ones. Okay. Uh, can I ask one more? Sure. Uh, so, like, do you suggest having a dedicated team, like bunch of resources <coughs> managing the program instead of uh, folks who are like, partly managing the program and partly doing 
uh, other activities at job? Yeah, I mean, I think it can go either way. So the way that our, our organization runs, you know, my team um, that runs this program is, is one of the larger ones in our security organization. So it kind of fit with, you know, what we were already doing and we had the kind of personnel available. Uh, but I definitely know that there are some other organizations that kind of split that function off where they've got a, a team that really focuses on just managing the program. And uh, we've also looked at that as far as like, you know, it'd be helpful to have like a TPM or somebody that could help in some of the really just more administrative parts of it. But um, this hasn't worked out yet, unfortunately. So we've taken more of the approach of trying to automate as much as possible as far as the tracking and metrics and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, actually, I had a question about some of the admin uh, stuff. So mm -hmm. how are you tracking your roster of champions and like their learning paths and all that? What, mm -hmm. what are you using spreadsheets or are you using an LMS? What are you using? Yeah, so the, the learning path is done through the LMS system as far as, you know, that they've completed, you know, maybe three of the six courses or whatever. But the primary way we're doing it right now is actually in JIRA. So it's, it's a little bit clunky, but it actually works out okay, where we basically have a JIRA project defined for the ambassador program. Each ambassador gets a, a JIRA issue, and that, you know, we have various, um, you know, properties of that issue that reflects their role and their, um, you know, the ability, uh, their um, the level in their program if they've completed the training, things like that. One of the great things about it being in JIRA is that then you can also link to any tickets that, um, you know, that that person has been involved in and, and any vulnerabilities that they've found. So that's a, we know, one nice thing about it. But we are in the process of moving into a more, uh, you know, dedicated database type system that would, uh, you know, connect in with some of our other, you know, personnel systems in that in order to make it a little bit less clunky of a process. But yeah, definitely want to try to get off of spreadsheets if you can. Yes. <clears throat> uh, I have two questions. So the first one is talking about the Google Code. If you want to have a dedicated, uh, if you want to have dedicated security champions program, uh, should it fall like who should own the responsibility of the program? Who should it fall under the CISO's vertical or under the BISO's vertical? Um, I'll be honest. I'm I'm still learning about the BISO and <laughs> what that role exactly entails as compared to the CISO. In our case, um, you know, it fell to my team as the, the, you know, design and architecture team. But you could see it, you know, we do have support. So we partner with our, um, you know, overall learning and management um, team, along with um, we've got a, a person that um, is, sits into a different part of our security organization that basically manages compliance training in that. And so, yeah, it, it you know, it's, it's, I always like to have a, a throat to choke, so to speak, of like someone needs to be in charge, but it's definitely good to pull in people from different parts of the organization, I would say. Okay. Right. Second question is that uh, how to face that challenge? Like, for example, you had a security ch champions program, but it failed, mm -hmm. and now you want to revive it. But the problem is that the reputation, like once you lose it, because people once they started, they joined, they were pretty active. But over the time, it just failed <clears throat> because people didn't show up. Mm -hmm. So how to face that challenge? What can be done to revive a dead, almost dead security <laughs> champions program? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's going to depend, I suppose, on the organization. In some cases, uh, it may be, you know, like many other things in life, you know, worth a rebrand, I guess, you know, maybe you call it something different than a security champions program. If that's been unsuccessful in the past, um, you know, have maybe some different people involved as, uh, as kind of the face of the program, so to speak. But it really depends. I mean, I think also we've, we've had a lot of, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think there's a lot of expectation now that most organizations are going to have some sort of security champions program, um, you know, as part of, you know, compliance and just general kind of SDLC maturity. So I think, uh, you know, it may be something that, you know, you want to make it bottoms up as much as possible. Like I said, you want your champions at least to be volunteers. So it's really a matter of kind of doing a little bit of a sales job on them, but also having, you know, buy-in buy from, from leadership. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, uh, I don't know uh, off the top of my head what the, the ratio is exactly. 
I, I know as far as what we're shooting for in our organizations is like 10% of the you know engineers will be security champions, but you know that depends a little bit on the organization as well and, and their kind of desire. Um, you know, and we've had you know we've thought about like you know do we want to like cast a wider net like is this something that should be part of like our onboarding training? Then, uh, but then it's like okay, well, do you you know how do you manage that if you end up with like a bunch of people on one team that have all been through the training? So there's a variety of questions there. Um, as far as our AppSec team, I would say uh, <clears throat> AppSec team is probably about two mm, uh, percent maybe of the engineering size. So I think it's you know the overall security organization is larger, but I think that's about where we're at one to two percent probably. Hey, I've had yep. uh, I had a similar question, but I'd like to expand on that. Mm -hmm. Do you have maybe from a cost benefit analysis standpoint, do you have some data at what point does it make sense to maybe uh, reduce the drive for more security champions? At what mm -hmm. point does it no longer make make sense uh, in terms of benefits, in terms of more vulnerabilities being found? Um, I I don't. I mean, uh, I think. What I would say is really it's more the distribution than the actual like raw numbers, because um, we definitely have seen that where you know, there'll be some teams that have multiple people that are part of the program, which is fine. You know we like to include them, but then you know, you've got some you know teams where you know a second level manager or even a third level manager doesn't have anybody under them that are security champions, and so it's really more I think the distribution that we're looking at. So that's what we've been focusing more on as our metrics is okay we've got you know what we call a team, you know, reporting up to a, a first level manager, we've got, you know, this many teams in our in Datadog and what percentage of them have at least one security champion. That's really the metric we've been focusing on and that's what we're trying to, to move up. Uh, so sure. what percentage of time do you allocate towards the champions? So obviously developers have velocity, they have to, t you know, they have to, they have a, their normal day to day job. So when you're selling this to kind of your C-suite management, what percentage are you saying that they that should be taken out of their normal day-to-day -day work? Yeah, great question. So I mean, uh, basically the way we sell it is that you know initially as they're going through like the training and the initial exercise in that, it's you know maybe ten percent of their time, um, and then you know on an ongoing basis it's more like five percent. So it's it's not a very significant amount, and there's. Like I said, we don't have a lot of requirements. Like once you hit the proficient level as far as like, oh, you need to attend this meeting or you need to do this other thing, it tends to be more kind of ad hoc as, uh, you know, we, we, what we try to do is we have, uh, you know, monthly training, you know, on various subjects for our security ambassadors as well as others. And, you know, we try to make that interesting where people actually want to join. But uh, yeah, that's uh, I think kind of the numbers that we've been used. And, and that's, I think, been acceptable to management, I think. You get beyond that, then it gets to be a little bit more of a, of a like I said, questioning, like, okay, what are we getting for that a level of effort? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, so you mentioned that we mm -hmm. encourage the volunteer base approach for mm -hmm. the security champions, and that's worked well. Uh, and then you use, uh, like, the Slack channel to have folks join easy mm -hmm. into the program there. I'm curious how you've balanced that with any potential concerns from from management perhaps on uh, like additional privileges and access that that might you know, provide the security champions when in it's uh, just kind of opt-in, uh, no approval required? Right, yeah, we uh, that's a good point. I mean, they don't get a lot of privileges when they're a trainee, the, about the only thing they get access to is, is just a little bit more data on uh, the security reviews that are going on that they might be involved in helping to support. Um, but um, yeah, as they move up, like I said, you might get additional privileges. And so, you know, that's something that we, you know, evaluate as we go up, but, uh, and we kind of work with our vulnerability management team on, but it's, it's we tend to be a very open organization. So it's uh, not like there's a lot of uh, uh, hoops really that we have, uh, you know, them have to jump through that we need to like, you know, provide them special access for. Because really, the, really what they're getting access to is, is data that's pretty much available to anybody anyway as far as uh, you know, vulnerability data is all available within our platform that we use internally. And so uh, the UA permissions would be in fixing the issues and that's you know, outside of our control. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I know I'm standing between you guys and lunch. Yes. 
talk about the security, um, security proponent role. Mm -hmm. So they are the one who define the priorities of what vulnerabilities they need to fix, you know, what are the time allocation as part of the sprint planning and so on. But what are some of the strategic approach have you taken to measure their KPIs? You know, so sometimes mm -hmm. the ball can drop at their core. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any tips for us on that? Um, how do you really manage that particular role to be efficient? Yeah, we don't measure that directly, I would say. What we look at really is going to be, you know, um, through our vulnerability management processes and then also our um, system risk reviews process. We, you know, we look at basically where is every team and how are they, you know, improving the different products that we have and different teams that they're working with. And so, you know, some of those teams don't have proponents. And so, you know, that maybe is an, a way that we can advocate for, you know, getting a proponent assigned. But and then in other cases, it's, you know, that's, it gives us kind of that point of contact of like, hey, we see that this team is lagging behind, we can reach out to this proponent and, uh, you know, it's always a negotiation, you know, as far as us, you know, and sometimes we got to go to their boss. Like if they're like a, you know, a lower level manager, we might need to go talk to like the product manager that can, you know, we can talk about like, hey, you know, we need to allocate this time for security. You know, it might delay, you know, this new feature a little bit, but it's, you know, worth it in the, in the overall. Well, I'm happy to take one-on-one uh, -on -one questions after this as well, but uh, thank you all for sticking around. Mm -hmm.